for Salvo. Inspector Montalbano knew to BBC4 at nine. Now, from 1997, one Japanese Monty Python fan has the day of her life as she plays guide to Michael Perlin. I'm en route to Sado Island, my first stop in Japan, on the way to Korea and China. I'm impatient to get there. Sado Island is where the Kodo drummers live. I first saw them perform 10 years ago. Their sheer power and energy has stayed in my memory ever since. Which is why I've come to this modest, respectable, out of the way island. In the Middle Ages, Sado was a place of exile where they sent those who disagreed with the government. Now it's where the Kodos work and train, and they've invited me to join them for a day. They're putting me up in a real khan, a traditional inn called the House of the Red Pear. It's run by the lady who grew up in it. Hello. Michael Perry. Michael. Michael Perry. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so let's go. Mama San showed me up to my room. Into the woods. Please. Thank you. This is lovely. Thank you. Yes, right. I get some color. This yukata. Yukata, right? Yes. What? Uh, what? Sweet, Shoes, wrong, no, wrong. No. Shoes are wrong again, I know. <laughs> oh, I see. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, yes, yes. Oh, dear. Uh, it's another shoe, a shoe error. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> yes, lovely. Is that a, that's a sort of like a dressing gown? Oh, I see, like, like you're wearing, yes. Yeah, yeah. Haori jacket. Jacket, I see. Hmm, very nice. Obi. 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 Obi, which is a belt. Yes. Hmm, mm, not quite sure when I put all this on. That is lovely, thank you. This. Um, that, that's in there, right. Now, this is sleeping. Where do I sleep? Sleeping, eh, to, I have to sleep. This. Yes? Oh, I see. That that puts that out, that futon. Yes. Do you put it out? Yes, I see. I, I, I... <laughs> yes, I think I'll, I'll lay it out. Good, fine, lovely. The Rio Khan is immaculate, like a newly finished doll's house. Everything has its place, even Mama San's goldfish, which are fed every afternoon at five o'clock. Every morning at five o'clock, the Kodo apprentices begin the day with a 10-kilometer run. I've asked if I can train with them, and my bluff has been called. There are 10 of us all together, and in deference to my great age, they've reduced the 10 kilometers to nine.
On their return, they make a lot of noise, which welcomes the sun and keeps down local property values. This is where it all started, the old schoolhouse which Kodo bought in 1981. Here, a few carefully chosen apprentices spend a year in frugal, almost monastic conditions. They cook and clean for themselves. They may not drink or smoke. They have one shower and one stove between them. They're here to drum. is based on the art of the traditional Japanese drum, the taigo. The word kodo means two things, heartbeat and children of the drum. The teaching emphasizes the need to play with the innocence and energy of a child. They drum for 90 minutes each morning and each afternoon, six days a week. It's like playing in the cup final twice a day. At the end of the year, only one or maybe two of these apprentices will be chosen to become full members of Kodo. Seiyu is 24. She's given up a job teaching English in Tokyo to attempt the near impossible. together with my heartbreak like, together yeah at first i have to i have to like think oh okay reason and i have to raise my um, my arm uh, more i have to think at first yeah. then as i get used to maybe 3 minutes or an hour maybe sometimes it takes like 2 hours mm. but as i play taiko more more then i become a part of like taiko yeah. In case you're thinking it's a youngster's game, this is Yoshi Kazu, one of the founders of Kodo. In three years, he'll be 50. Yoshi Kazu is one of the only two members of Kodo strong enough to play the hugely demanding big drum, O Daiko. At their new headquarters, the other virtuoso, Aichi Saito, is auditioning for a successor. そう。どうぞ。はい。もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、もう、も
Most of their catch seems to have gone straight to the house of the red pair. Seaweed. Seaweed. Lovely. Seaweed. Yeah. Igo, this name, Igoneri. 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 I'll try and remember. That's like Igonrone, but it's Igoneri. Vegetable. Mm. Vegetable. That's tough, tough food. Is it bean curry? Yeah. Shellfish. Shellfish. Shellfish, yes. Shellfish. shellfish. Mm. To accompany the shellfish and the seaweed, there is bream and squid and scallops, sea snails, abalone and soy sauce, and teriyaki of tuna stomach. Scarcely a denizen of the deep is unrepresented at Mama San's table. So, all served on quite different. Oh, What's magnificent, that magnificent, that? absolutely wonderful. What's that good? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you. This is the hot sake, is it? Yeah. Thank you. Well, cheers. Bottoms up. Mmm. Oh, shit. See, I'm terribly nervous. I must tell you now, on camera, I'm terribly nervous. I'm going to do everything wrong. But it's, isn't it beautiful? So all I've done is not the sake ever, that's all. Not a big deal. Bottoms up and bottom did go up. That's all. No giggling. Thank you. Now then. Try and get this meal back on the road. Look at that. Isn't that delightful? I'm going to have a little bit of this very succulent fish. My crash course in Japanese cuisine is just a golden memory next morning. This is modern Japan, fast food for people on the moon. Even out here in the country, a spotless train arrives at a spotless platform, spot on time. We're on our way south across Honshu, the largest of Japan's three main islands, from the rice plains of the northwest coast to the rice terraces in the mountain valleys. The journey to Tokyo surprises me. Two-thirds of this crowded country still consists of woodland and forest. Tokyo, fourth largest city in the world, is another kind of forest. Dense, uncompromising and overgrown. It's the first mega city on our route. And it's especially confusing if you're not Japanese. There is someone I know here who might help me make sense of it. She's a girl called Mayumi, who was Japan's first and most loyal Monty Python fan. Drop it already. I've fixed a rendezvous at a city centre cafe. But first, I've got to find my way there on my own. <laughs> well, almost on my own. <laughs> the only trouble is that though we've exchanged many letters, Mayumi and I have never actually met. Mayumi? Are you Mayumi Nabetsu? You are? <laughs> yeah. Hello, nice to see you. Hello. Am I allowed to give you a quick kiss? Is that... Oh. No. I don't do that in Japan too much. How are you? Welcome. <laughs> now, what is this? Oh, somebody told you I was coming. <laughs> welcome to Tokyo. Thank you. How are you doing? Fine. Well, it's very nice of you to do this crazy thing. It really is. But I thought we ought to meet after all this time. I think so, yeah. too. Well, because then what is it? 20 I can't... years already. 20 years when you wrote me the first letter? Uh-huh. Yeah. I studied learning English. I just I am a Japanese, yes. I am a girl, like yeah. this, and then you wrote me back. I loved your and letters. I say, I'm English, I'm a, I'm a boy. 20 years, I'd be a young lad of 32. You're probably like a bit you disappointed. Look like this. 
Oh, that is wonderful. <laughs> that, during the long hair. Holy Grail, yeah, isn't Holy it? Grail. Yeah, Holy Grail. Yeah. It's yeah. during the Holy Grail. Yeah. Well, we got to meet after all this time. Yeah, that's, that's really, great. that's really nice. You know, I've been trying to find my way around Turkey, so that's why I thought it'd be rather nice if you could, if you could uh, show me around. Sure. All right. Leaving the corporate tower blocks and cold plazas behind, Mayumi and I head for the slightly shady street life of a working-class neighbourhood called Asakusa. This street looks like a more gambling street. Yes. There's a stand yeah. called uh, newspapers of uh, horse racing. Yeah. There's a guy is selling yeah. a horse yeah. race ticket. Yeah. And this gentleman here, I think he won he? something. How much did he win? Can you ask him? Excuse me, we're from, from England. A great gambling nation. He spent only 1,000 yen. He spent 1,000 yen. What is it? With this ticket, it's Sunday. That means 370,000 yen he won. On a 1,000 yen bet. That's right. Good. Congratulations. Well, let's stick around. Back to your place. I feel a bit of a racing, racing fever coming on, Naomi. Okay, why don't we try? Should we, should we try? Hot, Hot fe fevers, number one. Yeah. Or do you want to try seven? Super license? Super license, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. BBC, very seven. appropriate. Super, Super license. license. Okay. I find horse race commentaries difficult enough to follow in English. In Japanese, it's totally impossible. For all I know, Super license could have been carried off by extraterrestrials. Uh, we won! We won? No, number seven. Really? Yeah. <laughs> we won! Number seven! Hey! Well done! <laughs> well, that's, there we are, you see? Nice look at that. Number seven! Yeah, that's yeah. it. <laughs> All right. Here we are. 126,000 yen. On a, what, a 5,000 bet? Right. Yeah. So it's about 12 to 1. And the horse was called Super License. So, you know, there we are. There, so we better not show this too much. We'll divide the winnings. A okay. grand total of 845 pounds, 63 pence. The most I've ever won on a horse in my entire life. That's yours. And uh, this is mine. <laughs> We celebrate at one of Tokyo's oldest restaurants. For 190 years, undeterred by earthquakes and American bombing, the Dojo Nabe has served the people of Tokyo with something they could not get in quite the same way anywhere else. There we go. Thank you. Let's get out there. Right. Well, I've been places without chairs before, and anywhere without a table. News of my big win must have got about, for the owner of the restaurant himself, Mr. Watanabe, insists on joining us. Yeah. What, Mr. Watanabe, what, what, what is it that you serve here? What's your speciality? Uh, order, dojo nabe. Dojo nabe. Dojo nabe. It's a yeah. uh, cooked uh, loach on the Cooked loach? Loach. I've no idea what loach is. The loach is a freshwater fish which has two vital attractions for the Japanese. It aids both digestion and virility. Once selected, the lucky or unlucky loach are tipped into wooden tubs and served copious amounts of sake, the Japanese rice wine. They drink in the sake, they become yeah, yeah, full yeah, of yeah, sake. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Enjoy, 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 enjoy drinking. Enjoy, it. They enjoy it. Yeah, yes, all right. I die. The loach get I pissed. Die. The loach get very pissed. And then what happens? Do so they do that? So that the tottering loach are then upended into a soup of largely secret ingredients. To complete the dining experience, each table is supplied with its own blast furnace. Is this, is this recipe 
been in use for 100 and for the 190 Mr. Watanabe's enthusiasm for loach borders on the obsessive. He even publishes a loach newsletter four times a year. Yeah, do you eat the whole fish? Bones and everything? Yeah. And uh, leeks on the top of it. Yeah. The whole fish goes in, really? Mm. Mm. The leeks, the onions are very, very good with it. They're really just, uh, just add that nice sort of clean taste. Mm. They tell me the restaurant has a famous slogan. Oh, that's your slogan, yes. If you keep eating, you can't uh, can't die. Because if you died, you wouldn't be able to eat behind. Oh. <laughs> This may look like an hallucination brought on by an overdose of loach, but it's actually Tokyo on a Sunday afternoon. A mile-long stretch of Yoyogi Park is closed to traffic and open to almost everything else. Or so it seems. In fact, it's all strangely clean and innocent. By dressing as English heavy metalers or Dutch punks or American rockers, these young Japanese can be outrageous and blame it on somebody else. It's an acceptable way of showing off in a country where showing off is not encouraged. Welcome to the Shinkansen. This is the Hikari Super Express, bound for Hakata. We will be stopping at Shin Yokohama, Nagoya, Kyoto, Shiosa. It's time to leave Tokyo and Mayumi, my excellent host, and head south on the bullet train, accelerating fast until we're lapping the Tokyo suburbs at two and a half miles a minute. The train will take us down to the southernmost island of Kyushu, from which there's a ferry for Korea. But we're almost 200 miles out of Tokyo before the featureless urban sprawl gives way to something like open countryside. Halfway there, we break the journey to look at a way of life which modern Japan has hardly touched. <laughs> This is the Zen Buddhist temple of Batsuji. It's been a place of silence and meditation for 600 years. The immaculate grounds reflect the love of precision, order and formality, which lie at the heart of Japanese culture. Seeing these Spartan surroundings makes me aware of how much clutter I carry with me. By the time I've climbed yet another flight of stairs, I'm ready to renounce all worldly goods, beginning with my suitcase. Later that afternoon, I'm summoned to meet the abbot, the Roshi. As I wait, I find my mind full of ignoble distractions. Like, do they have chairs? Welcome to Butsuji. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for letting me come here. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, an abbot of Butsuji. Yes. My name is Sokun. Please call me Sokun. Sokun. Yes. I will indeed Sokun. I know I'm only here for a very short time. Yes. <coughs> but I hope yes, I'll yes. learn something. Uh-huh. Yes. Is it possible, uh, Sokum, to say in a few words what the difference is between uh, the Zen Buddhism that you practice here and more traditional Buddhism? Yes, uh, we mainly practice uh, <coughs> Zazen, Zen meditation. And uh, not only by uh, learning uh, from books, but also uh, practicing uh, with a whole body with body and mind, mm. and the unity of body and mind, mm. we can attain our true nature. And from the morning uh, till night, for 24 hours, each moment is the practice. The most important part of the practice is meditation, to which I've been invited. It takes place in an old wood-beamed hall, the Zendo. The monks live here. Each one has a tatami mat three and a half feet wide and seven feet long. And that's about all. It's rather like the first day at school, watching everyone else and hoping not to make some terrible gaffe. When we're all sitting comfortably, nothing happens. Once I've accepted that nothing is going to happen, calm descends. All I have to do is be. After what seems hours, a bell indicates a short break in which tired limbs can be rearranged before the next session. Then, as calm is descending for a second time, something finally happens. Just as I'm wondering what it must be like to be hit so hard, I'm offered the chance to find out. He really can't do enough to make me comfortable. And in the true spirit of Zen, I thank him. I learn afterwards that this is the kesaku, the warning stick, a means of ensuring that meditation does not become an excuse for a quick nap. You know, the uh, monks should uh, sit for over 15 hours a day uh, when we uh, practice the big session. As I am only here for one night, what will I be able to learn in that time from being here, do you think? You? Yes. But this is your program. <laughs> you must not ask me. <laughs> oh, well. Interviewing her was a Zen activity. <laughs> <laughs> the spirit of the past haunts Japanese life in the most surprising ways. For 200 years, Japan hid away from the world, and the Dutch were the only people allowed to trade with her. In 
isn't a dream, you know. I mean, it's, you might think it's a dream. In fact, I almost thought it was a dream, but in fact, it is reality. Well, it's not actually reality, it, it's, it's, it's a fake, but... See, I'm in Holland, but I'm also in Japan. It's, it's all very zen. To celebrate this Dutch connection, a Nagasaki businessman has raised two and a half billion dollars to recreate 17th century Holland on the shores of the East China Sea. Most of the historic Dutch buildings, including the Royal Palace, are faithfully reproduced. But thanks to modern Japanese technology, the canals are self-cleaning and the merchants' houses are earthquake-proof. Four million Japanese come here every year to see what life in Europe is really like. This theme park with clogs on has rapidly become Japan's favorite honeymoon destination. on, but this celebration of historic links with the foreigner seems to me to be the fantasy of a country ill at ease with the rest of the world. 99% of all Japanese were born and still live in Japan, a country with no minorities of any size. The Dutch village is a success because it enables the Japanese to be part of the wider world without ever having to leave home. The wider world has always come to Japan through Nagasaki. First, the Dutch came here. Then the British and Americans set up Japan's first railways, coal mines and shipyards here. And in 1945, the biggest bomb the world had ever known was dropped here. At 11 o'clock on a Wednesday morning, the equivalent of 22,000 tonnes of TNT exploded above this spot. More people were killed in this one blast than were killed in all the bombing raids on Britain throughout the Second World War. More than 50 years later, the Japanese make a point of not forgetting. School parties come to lay streamers made up of paper birds, a token of respect for the dead. They sing songs of peace a few hundred yards from all that remains of a Catholic cathedral that lay directly in the path of the world's second atomic bomb. The bomb that wiped out a third of Nagasaki was intended for the Mitsubishi shipyard. Mitsubishi survived and with the help of American aid became the world's number one. But as the Japanese learnt from others, so others learnt from them. Across the water lies my next destination, the country whose shipbuilders beat the Japanese at their own game. We're just about to leave uh, Hakata port in, in Japan for the ferry trip to Korea, another country, and I feel all those things you feel about travel at this time, a bit harassed with sort of getting bags on and off and tickets and all that sort of stuff, but also a great curiosity about the country that we're going to see. Though Japan and South Korea are a short ferry ride from each other, they've never been happy neighbours. Tomorrow morning I shall arrive in Pusan. As I travel north to Seoul and beyond, I hope to find out more about this tiny country wedged in between Japan and China, our next destination. As we approach the land of the morning calm, I look out for images of Koreanness. 
that the busy waterfront could be any modern city at rush hour, and the concrete apartment blocks stare blankly back. The capital, Seoul, 300 miles north. A great new city ballooning out over the countryside from which it has sucked in 11 million inhabitants. These corporate office blocks belong to the secretive family conglomerates, which have guided Korea through one of the world's fastest industrial revolutions. In the short space of 20 years, Samsung, Daewoo, Hyundai and others have won this old country new recognition. I walk through one of Seoul's markets in the company of a young Korean journalist, Shin Na. What, what do the Koreans think? Are they very proud of what they've done here in Seoul? Yeah, they are very proud. Wait, I mean, you figure, they've just gotten out of a war just 20 years ago. Who, who do they sort of measure themselves against, the Koreans? They always look to Japan. They always sort yeah. of measure themselves against Japan because Japan was also leveled by war and they yeah. rose out of the ashes and you know, became a great economic power. Yeah. So the Koreans naturally look to their neighbors. Yeah. But, they still harbor yeah. a grudge. Oh, that's, yeah. There is still a great deal of anti Japanese sentiment among Koreans, especially the older Koreans. Um, Japanese pop culture, music, uh, cartoons, things like that are still banned yeah. in Korea. Japanese cars are banned. This anti-Japanese feeling is a surprise until you read the history books. Early this century, the Japanese occupied Korea for 36 years, pretty ruthlessly. Now the Koreans are determined to get their own back by winning the economic war. But Korean single-mindedness is showing cracks, especially among the young. Hanging here are photos of the victims of a massacre of 200 students in 1981, which has since traumatized Korean politics. There is outrage that the generals responsible for it have been granted immunity from prosecution. Police are deployed in anticipation of a march which might well end in a riot. Multi-party democracy in Korea is less than 10 years old and a very demanding child. Shin explains that these confrontations are increasingly common. Protesters and police now know each other's tactics. But the cars are doing U-turns to get out of the way, and to an outsider who hasn't a clue what's going on, it looks pretty threatening as students and union leaders take to the streets. How many do you reckon here? Here? Yeah, yeah, several thousand. Be. Several thousand. Shouting, shouting what? What are they shouting? The shouts of massacre and massacre the massacrers are directed against the generals involved, but there's also anger at a much wider corruption in public life. <laughs> this particular march was not in vain. A few months later, the generals were arrested, tried and imprisoned. Next morning, Shin and I are doing our best to cross the city. We've been invited to a wedding. In the South Seoul Marriage Hall, every single wedding day worry is taken out of your hands by an expert staff. Everything is for hire, except the guests and the person you marry. Brides can be dressed, decorated, and delivered to the altar in rented loveliness within the hour. Shin tells me that one in four Koreans is a practicing Christian, 
and the ceremony laid on here is a mixture of Western religious ritual and Korean business opportunism. First, the Korean opportunism. And this is what uh, the tradition that everyone mm -hmm. gives them to us at the beginning. Yeah. And this yeah. instead of a wedding present, instead of a yes, blanket. Yes, it could be in addition to. It can be in addition to. This right. is to help them pay for the wedding. Help them pay for the wedding. Good. Thank you very much. The proud parents are nearby. The women in traditional dress and the men dressed as band leaders. Their daughter is prepared for the 215 ceremony in the number two wedding salon. This family has opted for the simple piano accompaniment, knowing that the money saved can be spent on something more spectacular. Everyone is a bit misty-eyed by now, and the in-house video is there to record it. Outside the wedding salon, the atmosphere is less sentimental. As the men of the family count the takings, the bride is prepared for one last photo opportunity. This is all that's left of the way they used to get married. The happy couple are immortalized by the most sophisticated camera equipment in front of Korea's rented past. This is the real thing, the Pulguksa Temple, known officially as historic site and scenic beauty number one. In a place like this, you begin to get a clearer sense of what defines the Koreans. They have a history which is 5,000 years old. It's very different from anyone else's, and they're very proud of it. Despite constant invasions, they've kept their own language, their own alphabet, and their own architecture. Pulguksa stood for a thousand years before being destroyed by Japanese invaders in the 17th century. It's now restored, and after days among the concrete canyons of Seoul, its colour and craftsmanship is like a breath of fresh air. Today, when we leave Seoul, we shall encounter our first serious obstacle to progress around the Pacific Rim. It's called North Korea, and no matter how nicely you ask, North Korea is not really interested in seeing you. There is only one way to approach it. Well, this is the very start of a tour into what is probably one of the most militarised borders anywhere on Earth, so special restrictions uh, do prevail. And First of all, I have to sign a visitor's declaration uh, which says roughly the visit to the Joint Security Area will entail entry into a hostile area and possibility of injury or death as a direct result of enemy action, blah, 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 blah. Although incidents are not anticipated, the United Nations, the United States of America and the Republic of Korea cannot guarantee the safety of visitors and may not be held accountable in the event of a hostile enemy act. So I just have to sign this, let them off the hook, and uh, we can go on with the tour, which should be happening very soon. In front of them all is the motto of the 506th Infantry, some of the 37,000 American troops still stationed in Korea. The war they fight now is a propaganda war. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Freedom House. Today's GIs double as guides, taking groups of foreign tourists, no South Koreans are allowed, right up to the border itself and right back in time. Here, the Cold War is still frozen solid. Out there is the enemy. Once again, you are still under close observation, so we ask that you refrain from making any hand and arm gestures towards that side. Just off to your immediate front is North Korean Administrative Building. Ladies and gentlemen, it was built on a man-made hill to ensure its dimensions are one meter higher and wider than the building you are now standing on. We're in a world of minefields and tank traps, B-52 bombers, attack helicopters and quick reaction forces, ready for combat in 90 seconds flat. 
momentarily we'll be going in the vicinity of the Mac building, so you may begin taking photographs at this time. <laughs> From the way they talk, you'd think the Korean War had ended yesterday. In fact, it's never officially ended. In this temporary hut actually built over the border itself, MAC, the Military Armistice Commission, has been trying to turn a ceasefire into a peace for 43 years. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MAC building. The MAC building is where the four types of meetings is central to the supervision of the ceasefire agreement held. All the meetings last three to four hours. There's one on record that lasts 11 hours. Everything said in this building is translated into three languages, English, Korean, and Chinese. Beneath all the military speak, the undeniable fact remains that these are the world's least successful peace talks. Most of the time seems to have been spent discussing the placing of the microphones or the height of the tables. If our flags were here, you can see I stand on two-tier base while they're standing on three. They're both equal in height. But as our guide reminds us, the only thing that matters is the line running down the middle of the hut, and that's not budged an inch. Therefore, those of you on my left, welcome to Communist North Korea, while those of you to my right are relatively safe from the Republic. If you wish to make a cross into North Korea, please do so at that end of the table. And when those of you in North Korea wish to return back to the Republic, also please do so at that end of the table. If you have any questions, I'll be located to the southern end of the door. Rock soldiers. Busy in North Korea. I've been around a bit, but I've never known a more bizarre way to enter a new country. <laughs> Crossing the frontier has been reduced to something halfway between a parlor game and a visit to the House of Horrors. Nearly there. Inches to go. North Korea. Hmm? It's a chance for all of us from the lands of the free to experience a frisson of communism, a hint of what might have been, a whiff of the old enemy. As the tour rolls remorselessly on, my spirits remorselessly sink. No one seems to care if nothing happens here. The military get their training, the South Koreans get their border looked after, and those like me who believe in human contact get depressed. It's a place deserted by common sense. Even when we are allowed a clear view of North Korea, the village we can see is just another piece of propaganda. No one lives there. Well, this is it. This is the end of the road. We can't go any further into Korea without the risk of being either shot or arrested. It comes a bit of a shock to find such a heavily fortified, potentially lethal border in the middle of the open, outgoing Pacific Rim area. But I suppose the immeasurable sadness of a place like this is that it's not a border between two rival countries. It's a, a border that separates one country from itself. As the flags come down, so do our chances of passing unhampered around the Pacific Rim. North Korea may be a brick wall, but it's not one on which I'm prepared to bang my head. I'll leave that to somebody else. I've got to get to China. Twenty-three years after he took on this odyssey, Michael revisits Full Circle in his Travels of a Lifetime, new on BBC Two tomorrow at 8. And you can revisit his Pole to Pole expedition from 1992. The entire series, streaming now on BBC iPlayer. For centuries, the Scottish Highlands have been a law unto themselves. Two kingdoms, 